Welcome to Excess Returns, where we focus on what works over the long term in the markets. Join us as we talk about the strategies and tactics that can help you become a better long-term investor. Justin Carboneau and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital. Hi guys, this is Justin. In this episode of Excess Returns, Jack and I sit down with Kai Wu, founder of Sparkline Capital. Kai is a quantitative investor, machine learning power user, and former member of GMO's multi-billion dollar asset allocation team. Pulling from his research in machine learning and alternative data mining techniques, Kai weaves together a narrative of how disruptive and innovative companies, along with the rise of intangible assets and the increasing concentration of power among a few larger firms across industries, is impacting the market. This is Kai's first podcast appearance, but you never know it by his depth of knowledge and ability to discuss somewhat complex, evolving, and important investing concepts. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoy this discussion with Sparkline's Kai Wu. Kai, thanks for joining us today. Hello. Is this your uh, first podcast? Uh, yes, pretty much. <laughs> Well, we're, thanks, we're excited. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, well, I think this is this potentially could be the first of many for you because um, you are putting out what I think is some really good and interesting research, and uh, it's just really good stuff. And so that's why we wanted to to talk with you today. Um, and I think as more and more people sort of read your work, you might be getting more requests to be on podcasts. So this will this will be good practice for you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. What we want to talk to you about today is you put a number of pieces out and the focus has been on a couple of different areas. So you've written a lot about disruption or disruptive companies. You've written about monopolies and then the rise and the importance of intangible assets and how many of these things are influencing the market. For example, the performance of value stocks and the and the, the great performance out of technology stocks. You're sort of building, in my opinion, like a really compelling arc. And through these pieces, and I think through the through the research you're doing, um, you know, some of this has important implications for investors now and in the future. And it's just important stuff to think about. So we're going to work through each of these areas, disruption, monopolies, and intangibles. So let's start with the disruption category. But before we get to disruption specifically, I wanted to ask you about value stocks and their exposure to technology, um, because this is how you start the disruption piece. Um, one of the major explanations for values under performance is it's underweight technology. But can you just talk about how you looked at this and what your research showed and, and, and just how big of a short bet um, value is on technology? Yep. So the first thing I would note is that when I look at the value, obviously all value investors have slightly different ways of doing things, right? Discretionary, systematic, price to book, price to sales. Um, and so it's, it's hard to paint with too broad a brush, um, but just trying to kind of characterize the median manager, I took the Russell 1000 value and growth indices and then looked at the difference, right? So that would be the um, overweight, underweight. Um, if you were a long only investor or if you're a long short investor, you're a long or short position. And you're right, I started out um, doing two things actually. So first I looked at um, on a company by company basis, where were the big discrepancies? So for example, the growth index has an 11% position in Apple and a 10% position in Microsoft and, and the value index has zero. So effectively value is short 10% Microsoft, 11% Apple. And if you look, go through all the fangs, you find that of the five fang names plus Microsoft, value is actually short 38%, which is a huge bet, right? You're saying we're gonna short a 30%, 38% bet against the companies that have done the best the past 10 years. So no wonder value underperformed. Well, it turns out it's not that simple. Um, I, what, I did, what I did, there are two ways of doing things. I could have removed the fang names, but instead, what I did was I equal weighted the index because right now the value index is cap weighted, which means that it puts more weight on large cap stocks like Apple and less weight on smaller cap stocks. I said, let's take a look at the same constituents of value and growth, but instead equal weight. So that way Apple gets as much weight as, you know, tiny little name um, in the bottom of a thousand companies. And when I did that, I found that the drawdown that value has experienced was diminished, but still quite there. 
you're, you're still really deep in a hole, regardless of whether or not you are equal weighting or cap weighting. So that didn't explain the problem. The second thing is, you know, what you're addressing here is I looked at the sector exposures. And, you know, so Gix um, has 11 sectors at the top level. Um, and you point out, what you point out is absolutely true, that the value index has a 10% position in IT, information technology, and growth has a 45% position. So that's a 35% short position effectively in technology. That's a huge bet. And what would happen, you know, you might ask if we remove that, right? Maybe that's fully explaining why value has underperformed. So, you know, I didn't even have to do the work myself. There's an index called the MSCI Enhanced Value Index that literally just goes through sector by sector and goes, buys the cheapest stocks, shorts the most expensive stocks on a variety of valuation me metrics, including price to book, but also a couple other things. And then, you know, does it 11 times. And it turns out that that index has also underperformed. It hasn't helped you at all. So that's kind of surprising because, you know, we all intuitively know that if value has underperformed in the past 13 years, it must be because something's changed. And it must be because perhaps, you know, these technology stocks and the rise of, you know, the fangs have disrupted somehow um, the value style. But it turns out that at least when looking specifically at the mega cap tech names or at sectors, it doesn't explain the problem. So this kind of got me thinking, well, what's, what are these industry classifications actually doing? Um, and it's kind of funny because, you know, FANG has five letters, has five names. It turns out that only one of those names is actually an IT stock, Apple. The other four are not. You have Amazon, it's discretionary, and then you have three communication stocks. And by the way, if you look at those industries, sure, Amazon is a consumer discretionary stock, but so are the brick and mortar retailers that is disrupting. And in information technology, yes, Apple is innovative, but there are plenty of legacy companies that have been around for multiple cycles still sitting in the IT index. So my thesis coming in after looking at these data was perhaps we're missing something. Perhaps the industry classification schemes um, that um, are so widely used across the industry are not really capturing the full picture. And it doesn't, and it makes sense because look, the, there are a lot of problems with classifications. The most obvious one is that they're binary. Right, Tesla can either be an auto company or it can be a tech company. It can't be both. Amazon has AWS. Well, that's too bad because it's a retail company. So that is a huge problem. And, um, and uh, it's also not dynamic. It doesn't change through time. So as companies evolve their business models, if a traditional company were over time to become more innovative and more disruptive, um, that wouldn't show up. So we need a new, a new tool. And that's where I kind of dusted off some of the work I've been doing in AI and machine learning. Um, so I am kind of a power user, I guess, of natural language processing, um, which is the technique used to take unstructured data, which is most data, um, you know, text, audio, images, in my case, text, and extract information from it for the use of quantitative uh, models. Um, and one technique in particular became pretty useful for this exercise, um, which is topic modeling. So any textual document can be viewed as a mixture of different topics. So for example, if the Wall Street Journal ran an article on Apple and it talked about the supply chain, the labor practices, and perhaps really a new product launch maybe, um, those are three topics that are being discussed. So I actually have a chart, I think it's pretty cool. Um, I think it's exhibit 12, 10, no, sorry, exhibit 12 in the value paper, um, where I, I call it the, the disruption meta narrative where I'm able to take all the different words that appear in news documents, financial filings, earnings calls, and cluster them in like a two-dimensional projection um, next to each other. And it's super interesting because you find that words align themselves according to disruption. So you have e words that are talking about e-commerce or mobile, cloud computing, cybersecurity, AI, and these things all sit next to each other in this, in this projection. And then you have non-disruptive words you know, off to the side. And the confluence of all these things is what I call the disruption meta narrative. And what I'm able to do is go through all these documents for all companies and look at how exposed each company is to this narrative. And I effectively score each company, say from negative one to one on how disruptive they are. For the sake of simplicity for this paper, I just uh, reduced that to a binary classification. In other words, either you are disruptive or you're not. And you know, this is where you can kind of see the overlap, but not perfect correlation between industries and disruption. 
Like it turns out, for instance, that most IT companies are somewhat disruptive and not many financials are. With that being said, there are still 20% of financials that are disruptive and 20% of IT companies that are non-disruptive. So you, you found, you were basically able to isolate within industries how much disruption was occurring within that industry and then look at value sort of in that context. I mean, the, the disruption classification is distinct from industries, but just as a way of kind of cross tabulating how um, similar or different it might be, I looked within industry to see what percentage of names are disruptive, but the actual technique used to produce the one zero score um, as being classified as disruptive or not, had no information as to what industry companies were. Did, did you look at this on the long side as well? So you, you would think, you know, given what's going on in the past decade, you know, th there's a lot of different ways to classify maybe growth type companies, but this seems like a really interesting way to do it. It's, it seems like this would perform very well. You know, if you were using this on the long side to try to select your portfolio of, of stocks, did, did you look at it that way as well? So glad you brought that up. Exhibit 15 um, shows the performance of some of the sub themes. Um, and so this is on the long side. So I have cloud computing, robotics, AI. Look, if you want, <laughs> if you or your clients want me to build a portfolio for them of growthy, um, you know, high tech names, we can do that. And the cool thing is you can do it without hiring to hire, having to hire analysts to actually comb through all these things. It's all automated. It's all, you know, completely objective going through saying which companies are actually um, doing stuff in these different spaces. And then what I can do is I can aggregate it. Um, to what I call the disruption meta, meta narrative, where I take all these sub themes, combine them into one broader theme. And yeah, the performance of that has been phenomenal. Of course, with the benefit of hindsight, right? If you were sitting there in 2010, would you know that um, e-commerce would take over the world? Maybe, maybe not. Um, obviously it's easy for us to sit here 10 years later and be like, yeah, that would, you know, of course. Um, but that being said, if someone wanted to say, I think my portfolio is underexposed to growthy names and not just kind of the traditional growth names defined as like, oh, you know, one year increase in like earnings per share, but growth names as defined by being in these kind of themes, these baskets of um, disruptive technologies, then yeah, this would be a really interesting way of doing that. You may not have looked at this, but does it look really different in terms of if we, if I was using more traditional growth metrics, metrics, if I was using, you know, sales growth or earnings growth, does what you come up with in a disruptive portfolio look very different than that? Or does it have pretty high overlap? It's much higher octane because it, it is, it is kind of explicitly focused more on, uh, you know, specific themes, um, disruptive technology themes, as opposed to companies can grow their earnings through, you know, just like blocking and tackling just traditional channels. Um, and they would also show up in the growth index, but wouldn't show up here. Those themes are like cloud computing or cybersecurity. Like we know that those, to your point about 2010, I mean, we know that those are some like hot disruptive themes areas now, but we may not have known that in the past. Was there anything you saw when sort of mining this data that would, you could see like a change in a theme, like almost the momentum of a theme to say, you yeah. know, this looks like this thing is emerging here. This is getting popular. You want to start allocating or finding securities, you know, using your AI system, machine learning system that are playing in this area. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great point. And Yes, you can very clearly track the salience of various topics in the broader narrative. I think, imagine like a huge like word cloud or a huge cloud of different themes kind of like realigning themselves um, through time. And as you kind of fast forward frame by frame, you start to see alignment around these ideas. And so that's how you would, you know, be like, hey, wait, what are these things that um, are becoming very important? Let's like zoom in on this and figure out if this is something we want to do. Now you could do it programmatically. You could just say, look, I'm going to look do a trend following momentum strategy as you're suggesting and say, look for things that, you know, have your model, have your topic model, define things that are potentially interesting and then look to see if there's been growth in fundamentals or price over say the trail in 12 months and then go along those things. That would be one way of doing it. Um, but there also, you could also do it more fundamentally if you wanted to. I want to ask you about putting this whole theme of disruption in a long-term context. So there's sort of two th schools of thought here. One is that we're in a new world here and that disruption is going to be a very investable thing. And it's going to be something that's going to be going on. You know, the trends we've seen in the past decade are going to go on for a long time. The other side of it is, I don't know if you've read O'Shaughnessy did a paper um, where they sort of looked at disruption in history and they looked at the 1926 to 1941 period where we, where there was a lot of disruption and value underperformed for a really long period of time. But then eventually 
the traditional companies sort of figured out how to use the disruptive technology. Mm -hmm. And that led to maybe the traditional companies doing better again. I'm wondering what you think about that and where we are now. Do you think we're in a long-term disruptive trend or do you think we're maybe on the other side where the other companies may figure out how to use this and you may see your more traditional firms doing well again? So it doesn't so much matter who's using the technology, just that the technology is being used, right? Like if Walmart is able to build an e-commerce platform successfully, which it seems to be doing a good job with, it's a traditional retailer, but it's managing to adopt some of these technologies as opposed to firms that aren't able to adapt, they will die, right? Like think about New York, that's where I am right now. You know, you have a lot of these restaurants that have pivoted and started doing a lot of delivery. They're surviving, those that don't do it, you know? Um, and so that, and, and I think that trend towards a secular trend towards cloud computing, e-commerce, like I don't think brick and mortar retail is gonna make a huge comeback. I don't think Blockbuster is gonna start suddenly come back from the dead and that business model will survive. That being said, like I can see the other side of other point of view very clearly as well, which is the, the narrative can be overblown. Think about 2000, it's even a better, more recent example. Technology is not cyclical. It doesn't like go like this, it just goes in one direction. That being said, the price, the fundamentals is cyclical. And it can you know, simultaneously be the case that we are on the cusp of a transformation in the way our economy is working. And I can get more into that with the intangible asset uh, stuff, but also simultaneously be the case that the current hype around these uh, and disruption is overdone, right? You can simultaneously be like, yeah, okay, like the cloud makes a ton of sense. Everything's moving to the cloud, but also that Robinhood traders probably are too bold up on Tesla. Like those two things can, can coexist simultaneously. And I think that's where we are right now. It's interesting because when you, when you look at like Walmart, what you were talking about, that that's a, an, an advantage over like a disruption type factor, I would think over standard factors, because like you were talking about, I would assume a disruption based model, if Walmart starts to use this advanced technology, will start to pick up Walmart. So yeah. whereas a more traditional model might not, I don't know if I'm right about that, but it, it, yeah. would, it would sort of pivot as these companies begin to learn how to use the technology. Right. And by the way, the simplest model, the industry classification would not get it right at all because Walmart and Amazon and all these companies would just be in the same category together. There's no way of distinguishing, you know, online versus um, brick and mortar um, sales channels. So let's move on to the intangible since you just um, mentioned that you wrote a paper on intangible assets. But before we get into, I think, the details behind that, maybe you could just start by helping us understand what an intangible asset actually is and maybe give us some examples of intangible assets and how you know big they are relative to sort of the tangible assets in the economy today so tangible assets we can start with that that's pretty simple simple a factory um you know machinery financial assets are tangible um you know bank balance sheets is mainly tangible um but off balance sheet are intangibles and intangibles are things like technology um, scientific innovation, patents, um, trade secrets, um, organizational competencies. So for example, if my culture is better than yours, my employees are more productive. Um, if, um, you know, network effects are a huge source of uh, intangibles, we can get into that uh, later with the monopolies and um, also brand, right? Consumer loyalty. You think about Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola spent $90 billion over the course of its lifetime on building its brand through advertising. And that doesn't show up on its balance sheet which is ridiculous, right? And then you have companies that invest similar amounts of money in R&D to build you know, really advanced technologies. Again, that's not an asset on their balance sheet. And so kind of where I, where I started this paper on the intangible economy was where I left off. It's almost like a sequel to the value paper. And I was kind of like, this value paper is great, but like, I don't wanna be the guy who just criticizes but doesn't provide constructive um, feedback on how we can kind of move the ball forward. Like as a value investor, Okay, so we have this headwind, that's kind of annoying. It's good to know we're implicitly short technology and disruption, and we can therefore figure out based on our view on whether it's you know a permanent thing or just a temporary shift, um, whether or not we want to, how we want to deal with it, but it's just good to know. But the question is, if you're like a stock picker, what do you, how are you gonna change your process in order to adapt to disruption? Um, and I actually you know, ended my first paper where I began my second paper, which is Warren Buffett. So I talk about how you know Buffett started his career, um, you know, in you know as a mentee of Ben Graham, security analysis, with kind of the cigar butt style of investing. The idea being, you know, you find that cigar butt on the ground, you pick it up, get that one last puff, and throw it away. Um, and then when he you know met with met, met Munger, 
he realized, look, this isn't a very good strategy. First of all, it's not sustainable. You get one puff and then you have to find the next cigar butt. And second of all, it's not sustainable. As my AUM increases, there are fewer names available for me to do here. Um, and that's when he kind of came up with the kind of uh, quality business idea where he, and this is this coincided by the way, with the transformation of the US economy from being industrial, right? So what, in Ben Graham's day, it was steel mills and railroads. And then by the time Buffett was kind of mid to late career, kind of at his head of his powers, he was, you know, buying Coca-Cola, the great consumer brands. Um, and that was the big moat that he discovered, you know, good brands, good managements. Um, this is the kind of some of the early sources of intangible assets. And he was very early in recognizing that you can't just look at the price to book ratio of a company. You have to take into account some of these intangibles like brand. Um, and then you fast forward, you know, one more stage to 2016. So up until then, Buffett had famously been um, very shy to invest in any technology names. I think he may have held one or two, but effectively he was very famously indifferent about technology. He said, look, outside my circle of competence, I don't do technology. And then he put you know, $35 billion in Apple and the stock tripled. So now he has a hundred billion dollar position in Apple. So one fifth of Berkshire Hathaway is a single name, which is a technology stock. So I actually went back and like looked at um, you know, some of his speeches around the time um, when, when he made that investment. And uh, you know, he said in his 2018 shareholder meeting, I didn't go into Apple because it was a tech stock, but because of the value of their ecosystem and how permanent that ecosystem could be. He then said, the four largest companies today by market value do not need any net tangible assets. They are not like AT&T, GM, or ExxonMobil, requiring lots of capital to produce earnings. We have become an asset light economy. So that's kind of the starting point for my, my kind of deep dive into intangible assets, which is here we have Warren Buffett buying Apple in 2016, which by the way, Apple had a price to book ratio of four when he bought it. So in other words, the only 25% of the value of the company was explained by its tangible assets. There's this massive amount that um, is intangible. He clearly thought that that amount is greater, was greater than the market cap and he was right. Um, namely, he recognized the power of the network effects, but just more broadly, what Buffett was saying is, look, we can't, we can no longer evaluate companies simply using the, you know, price to book kind of hard asset methodologies that worked back in the industrial economy. The world is totally different now. We really have to focus not just on the brand value, which was the kind of this second stage, the Coca-Colas, but also on the network effects, the apples. Um, and, you know, the other question you asked was how important is this today? So I studied economics in college and to kind of going back to my roots, I dug up this paper. So these guys, Corrado, Holton, and Sichel, um, they were some of the early economists to recognize that the national accounting framework was missing intangibles. And they spent a lot of time figuring out how to get that information back in. And so that's things like, you know, R and D artistic originals, training, uh, software, and they came up with, assum with assumptions as to capitalization rates and depreciation to get them back in the GDP. Um, and if you look on that basis, you basically see a chart that looks like this. In other words, tangible investment used to be high and has come in coming down. Intangible investment has been low and coming up and they crossed in around the, the mid nineties, like late nineties. And this is a flow, not a stock. So what that means is that every year as the gap is exists, um, the stock of intangible capital will increase relative to the total stock of capital. And so what we care about obviously as investors is not so much the macro economy, we care more about individual names. So can we replicate this framework bottoms up for stocks? And it turns out we can. Um, there's a bit of a challenge here, which is um, that companies don't break out. They don't itemize their expenditures in a clean enough way. So R&D is pretty clear, but um, the marketing expenses, um, investment in training your employees, creating you know, better organizational competencies shows up in this line item called SGNA, selling and general administrative expenses, which is just like a kind of a catch all for like everything. So they come and just throw everything in there. And so a lot of work needs to be done to figure out what percentage of that um, you know, is actually an investment in intangible capital and what of it is just kind of cost of doing business or, you know, some other sort of miscellaneous expense. And so there's been a ton of work doing this. Um, I kind of just took, I'm not the first person to do this. I just took the kind of standard approach that a lot of people have been using, calculate the amount of tangible and tangible capital, build it up from the bottoms up. And I found that 42% of the capital stock today 
is um, intangible, and then that implies 58 is is tangible. But that that ratio is changing over time, as we know. More investment in intangibles is create being created versus tangibles. So it's only a matter of years before that crosses. So this is a big deal, right? In the 1980s, it was a rounding error, and now it's almost half of the value of corporate America. And then obviously, industry by industry, it could be a significant amount. Apple, Coca-Cola, um, any pharma or biotech stock, it's most of their value. You you may have hit on this in that answer. So if, if you did, I apologize. But what, in your mind, what is what are good ways to measure intangibles using sort of commonly reported you know, financial data that's out there. I mean, what do you, you know, you mentioned the SGNA and, and some of that other stuff, but is there other methods? Not really. I mean, the, the approach that I think most people have used to try to incorporate intangible into um, the balance sheet is, you know, so I'm sure you guys are both aware of capitalization. I'll just explain it for everyone else. Um, so the idea of capitalization is imagine I spend a hundred million dollars buying a factory, building a factory that will have a useful life of 10 years. What I can do is I can say, I now have a hundred million dollar factory on my balance sheet and I will depreciate it by $10 million per year for the next 10 years. And so I'm going to spread the cost of that investment over its useful life. Now you can do that for factories, but based on gap principles, you don't do that for um, in intangible investments. So for example, if I have a hundred million dollar investment in a new drug, well, that's just a cost. It comes out of my bottom line. Um, if I have a hundred million dollar marketing campaign to advertise my new product, that's a cost that goes away. It's not creating an asset. So that $90 billion that Coca-Cola spent, that's not going on their balance sheet. And that's a big inconsistency that a lot of people have pointed out. Um, in my paper, I mentioned Baruch Lev, who's you know, pretty vocal on these issues. Um, you know, he advocates this idea of trying to make more consistent the principles around capitalization. And you know, there's even one more wrinkle, which is kind of weird, which is that intangible assets that are acquired from a third party. So if I do an M&A transaction, I acquire in other companies, um, um, IP, that goes on as goodwill. So that is on my balance sheet. But if I internally generate it, it's not on my balance sheet. So again, that's weird because it's distortionary. It now favors companies that engage in serial M&A and it penalizes companies that are homegrown, um, um, do homegrown innovation, which just seems a little backwards and weird, but that's just the way it is. And, um, you know, Lev and you know, plenty of other folks have argued that we should close that. And, you know, in, in, in one way of doing that would be to take start capitalizing intangible investment. So we know how much money companies are investing in R&D each year. What we can do is we can say, well, what percentage should we assume it should be capitalized? What should be the depreciation schedule? And in the exact same kind of methodological framework that is currently used for tangible assets, you can apply that to intangible. And that's what people have been suggesting as like a remedy. Now, one of the things I talk about you know, in this paper is that that's not really a satisfying solution, that it helps but it doesn't solve our problem. Um, unfortunately, there's two problems. First of all, the data itself is not itemized. It's not granular enough. We don't know if R&D is truly investment in new technologies or new drugs versus just trying to replace the existing pipeline. We don't know if um, you know, your marketing budget is truly launching a new product or just trying to kind of tread water. Um, but more importantly, intangible assets are, are structurally different than tangible assets. Um, there's a really good book called Capitalism Without Capital, um, where they talk about the four S's. Um, and just kind of for simplicity, there's two things effectively that um, distinguish intangible from tangible assets. And that the first one is that um, they're way more uncertain. In other words, if I build a factory, it's quite likely I'll get most of the value back. It's not precise, but I can probably predict with a reasonable degree of certainty how much that's going to be worth. But if I spend $100 million on investing in an R&D project, it could be worth $10 billion or it could be worth zero. Um, same with like a marketing campaign. Um, you just don't know if it's going to go viral, maybe it won't. And so these things are just so inherently hard to predict, which is, by the way, why accountants, being conservative people, decided they didn't want to capitalize in the first place. Um, and the second uh, you know, major distinction um, with intangible assets is that they are scalable. Right. So most, so for example, if I'm going to write a piece of software, I put, I, I spend my upfront cost in writing that software, but then to ship one marginal unit, it's zero cost. So um, that makes this, it's a really weird dynamic. And this is the idea, and this feeds into network effects and you know, increasing returns of scale. Um, but the upshot is that a lot of uh, industries facing these dynamics end up becoming winner take all, where it's like a natural monopoly. Um, we don't need 
a hundred social networks. We just need a few. Um, so, you know, the combination of these returns to scale idea and the, um, uh, um, the uncertainty inherent in intangibles make them just structurally a different beast. And so I don't actually believe that in accounting, even if we were to reform accounting data, it would be a panacea. I think it would help. And we certainly should try. We can't just ignore it. I mean, it's half of the value of companies, but we definitely need to go beyond that. So you just got into this a little bit, but there's been a big debate about this in terms of the, these things are obviously very difficult to measure. And you, so you have some people that say they don't belong on balance sheets. This is something, you know, practitioners can adjust for on their own. And then, and then there's other people that say, well, we're just completely misvaluing these companies. This belongs, even if we can't value it perfectly, these belong in standard accounting data. I'm, I'm wondering where you come down on that. Well, I think first of all, disclosure is important. Right? I think it, it, it should be, if we can encourage companies to itemize at a more granular level, where um, you know what their expenditures are, that will help with trans investor transparency. We'll all benefit from that. I think the problem is that a lot of the industry is moving passive, as you guys know. Um, basically, everyone's passive now. There's all these ETFs. Uh, you know, value, the Russell 1000 value ETF. It literally just buys things with low price of books um, on, on that basis. So yes, it. In an ideal world, you'd have active investors who are smart enough to see through the kind of nuances of accounting. But in the re in reality, most people pa are passive, and so it'll just create massive distortions to not do anything. Like I don't, I don't think that, as I mentioned, um, you know, capitalizing things, these things at historic cost makes that much is, is like that helpful because you know the the true value is not really that linked to the amount of money you spent creating that IP. But it's better than nothing. At least we know that Coca Cola has tried really hard to build its brand. Whether or not it was successful, you know, we can figure that out later. In your paper, just kind of stepping out for, to the macro view for a second, you did talk about um, the relative performance um, with value stocks and growth stocks and international stocks and U.S. stocks um, with regard to intangibles. So can you just talk to um, sort of what the implications and how the relative valuations of these groups are being affected by intangibles? Yeah. So, you know, one thing. So first of all, we know three things. We know that the market is very expensive on price to book or Tobin's Q, which is basically the same thing. We know that the US market has outperformed international and is very expensive compared to international. And we know that value has um, underperformed growth and growth networks are expensive relative to value, um, again, on price to book. But you know maybe it's the case that book value doesn't fully me measure the capital stock of companies. We, re we already showed just now that you know, there's obviously some variance in estimates, but roughly half and half. Let's assume that, you know, at an aggregate level, half of the value of the capital stock is intangible versus tangible. And if we're just going to miss that, if we're just going to ignore that, then obviously just, that creates huge distortions. So, you know, for example, the, at the aggregate market level, right, one thing you, you'll see is that, you know, the price to book of the U.S. economy, the entire market, was pretty mean reverting for many, many years. And then... You know, 20 years ago, it kind of like step changed up and has been mean reverting at a higher level now. And it seems to be spiraling off into infinity, by the way. So like price of book is just kind of un untethered now, which is really weird. But maybe it's not that weird if you think about it, because, well, if book, the denominator in that case, is just missing an ever growing amount of value, if you were to adjust for that, it, it helps bring it down. Now, does it make the market look cheap? No, it just makes it look like more reasonable. And by the way, more mean reverting, which is the more important point. Um, the same thing happens when you look at international versus U.S., right? The, those same economists who did the national accounts for the U.S. did the same thing in Europe. And they found, not surprisingly, that the U.S. invests more in intangible assets than Europe. And so, again, that explains part of the discrepancy between the U.S. and European valuations. And then you go to value stocks, where we all know value stocks, as I discussed earlier, are really short technology. They're also short healthcare, by the way, so like biotech and pharma which are the intangible rich industries and they're very long financials, which is the tangible rich industry. Again, tangible being defined, including financial assets in this case, right? So obviously put aside Lehman and all the CDOs and all balance sheet stuff. For the most part, most banks and financial firms have everything on their balance sheets there for you to see. There's no, no surprises there. And it makes sense, right? Because if current accounting rules penalize companies that are intangible rich, then value metrics like price to book will inherently just be we'll just hate those sectors. And what we find is that if we were to capitalize intangibles, as we discussed, it helps offset some of that 
bias, but it doesn't completely offset it. So just like with the level of the market, the US versus international, and now with value, we find that these adjustments help a little bit, but it doesn't explain the full picture. There's other stuff going on that can't be fully captured simply by an accounting adjustment. Um, and by the way, if you look at the performance of value, right, a lot of people, they are, well, you know, once we, once we put this adjustment in, it'll solve all our problems. We can just kind of go on business as usual, value will continue working. Well, that's actually wrong. Um, just as we saw with the sector adjustment, when we said, let's sector neutralize value and it still didn't work. That's basically what we find here, which is you adjust for intangibles. Yes, you remove a lot of the sector biases and then some other issues with value, but it doesn't solve your problem. You're still in a drawdown. It's a, one of the questions I always tend to ask in these podcasts, like someone was making fun of me on Twitter about it is this whole idea of is traditional value investing dead? And, and I'm wondering, I mean, a lot of the stuff you've put in these papers would indicate maybe it is. And, and I'm wondering what you think about that. I mean, do you think investing in stocks based on, you know, low price to book or low PE using sort of a more standard metric, do you, do you think that's a strategy that's going to work going forward? Or do you think practitioners are going to have to adjust for these types of things in, in order to be successful? So I think there's like the secular and cyclical uh, issues. But I think on the cyclical basis, I mean, value defined by, you know, standard fama French, price to book, whatever, is two sigma cheap. Um, and as I mentioned before, I do think there's a little bit of like a tech bubble going on. So I, I could I could easily see in the next five to 10 years, a reversion of valuations, like the value of value kind of getting back to fair, um, which would be, suggest that, you know, just continue doing what you're doing, benefit from that. But again, I, I'm not, I don't really try to do market timing. I don't try to do, um, uh, factor timing. Um, what I care more about is over the next hundred years, will value work? And if I'm answering that question, I, I hate to say it, but I, I will have to say that I think we do need to adapt our metrics, right? The idea of price the book, the idea of the Ben Graham security analysis was evolved and developed in a time period where, um, we live in an industrial economy and the world is just so different now. And it's only increasing, right? The amount of intangible capital is only increasing through time. I don't think that's a cyclical thing. It's not like it's going to go back and revert. It's just only going to be getting bigger and bigger over time. And for us to just be using press book blindly uh, and not adapting our metrics does not seem like the right thing to be doing. The last thing I want to ask you about the intangible section is you, th what you did to try to value intangibles was really interesting. You looked at things like brand, you looked at patents, you looked at network value, and you were able to sort of value those and you got better results than trying to use the standard balance sheet things to try to measure intangibles. Can you just talk a little bit about the process you used and what you did there? Yeah. So let's go back to Brooke Lev, um, the NYU professor in accounting. He, you know, and he had this big book, he called it like the end of accounting or something bold like that. And he basically comes to the same conclusion that I do, which is, yes, we should be doing all these things. And he's been saying this for, you know, 10, 15 years, we should be doing all these changes to accounting, but it's not going to solve the problem. The thing is that there are all these other things that need to be captured due to the unique nature of, um, of, of the intangible assets. So he has this thing he calls like a strategic map where he includes all these intangible assets like brand patents, you know, IP, things like that. And says, we need to create more disclosure around those things. And I 100% agree with them. Um, you know, as a kind of quantitative investor, you know, there, you, you probably know there's like this huge movement around alternative data and alternative data is generally more useful for trading, but it turns out that there are also plenty of alternative data sources that are very useful for long-term buy and hold value investors. And, you know, I talk about two examples in my paper. So, you know, one thing I did was I scraped the uh, US patent office website. I can download every single patent grant that's ever happened um, in the US. Um, well, not those that were destroyed by fire, but pretty much all of them. And um, you, know, you can look at um, you know, how many patents companies have. And it pretty much mirrors the story that I told just now, which is, first of all, the number of patent applications has increased um, dramatically the past 20 years and grants um, across the world, not just in the US. And that most of the activity in patents and the importance of patents is in the two sectors of healthcare and, um, te and technology, as you might expect. Um, you know, it turns out the leader in patents is IBM. It's been around for a long time and it makes a lot of patents. Um, but one thing you can do is you can say, well, one thing I know is that the, wor the world is very passive these days and people tend to be using very naive metrics like price to book. And price to book, we know, naturally penalizes companies that are intangible rich. If most of my value is intangible, I'm going to look expensive. Um, and therefore, would it be an interesting investment strategy to just buy companies that had a lot of patents or had, you know, patents linked more specifically to ideas like disruptive ideas would be an even better way of doing it. 
um, well, it turns out, yes, um, that the company, that the market does undervalue companies with strong patent um, fortresses. And then the analogous thing I look at is within the marketing side, which is brand. And, you know, I, I didn't do this work myself. I just went out and found that there are a few firms out there, marketing firms, that conduct these massive surveys to ascertain um, c consumer preferences. So, for example, I might ask you, Jack, hey, so, like, here is, like, 30 soda brands, which is your favorite? And you kind of like rank them all. And then what we can do is we can take that information, feed it through um, the segment level data for certain companies and determine what, what percentage of their sales, say, in a certain, say for Coca-Cola, of like the product Coca-Cola, um, is due to their brand, which is if they were just a generic product. Um, and then that you know, allows you to build up a value. In their case, there's a lot of dispersion. It's a very subjective exercise. They, on average, say, hey, Coke's brand is worth $60 billion. We know they invested $90 billion in creating it. So, you know, could be right. Um, you know, obviously, a lot of the people they were marketing to back in the day aren't really buying soda anymore. So, may not be wrong. This thing depreciates. Um, and what you find is that it does plug a big gap. Same as, as I mentioned with the overall market with Tobin's Q. Um, you find that not only does it level shift price to book back down to a more reasonable level. So, it's not like these companies seem so expensive all the time. But also the fact that like right now, price to book looks like it's spiraling to infinity kind of goes away. It makes it look much more mean reverting. And by the way, in the same way I mentioned with patents, well, it turns out that companies with strong brands are, are uh, misvalued by the market. If you have a strong brand, that means you have a str strong intangible asset, which value investors are shorting because they think you're expensive on price to book. And therefore, just buying them from those value investors, you actually make a lot of money. So two simple examples of how to make money. But the, the broader point is that you know we we really do need to look beyond simply the accounting data because accounting data only tells us historic cost it only tells us how much money a company invested over the course of its of the past n years in creating an asset but it doesn't tell us how valuable the asset actually is in like the fair market um, as i mentioned before you know if i i could have one marketing campaign that goes viral and, and i spend a dollar on it and it ends up being worth you know a million dollars or I could have a million dollar marketing campaign that's worth nothing because you know nobody clicks on it Let's move on to the third block, which is monopolies. So that was um, another paper you wrote where you talked about um, this trend that has really, it's, it's kind of been going on, but um, there's this rise of monopolies happening in the market and this concentration of you know, more power across fewer companies um, in many industries, actually. And you, you sort of start with the mega cap tech companies because they're sort of front and center. They're the biggest companies, obviously, right now. And they're the ones where it's very clear they have some monopolistic power, but you actually show it's, you know, happening across many industries. So can you just talk a little bit about how you went about looking at this and maybe some of the conclusions that came to with monopolies in terms of how they're influencing industries and the types of characteristics that monopolistic companies tend to have? Yeah. So if you go back to the last paper, I talked about how intangible assets are scalable, right? And how that could potentially create this winner take all dynamic where you have these tech platforms effectively become monopolies and there's, and there's, and that's the efficient outcome actually. It would not be efficient to have a thousand social networks. Just having a few is good enough. Well, it turns out that that's actually wrong. It isn't the case, it is not the case as I had initially assumed that monopolies were purely a technological um, byproduct. Um, it turns out that if you kind of look, let's look at the example of, a, you go to the grocery store, okay? You're looking at like the beer aisles. I like beer. So I'm looking at different beers. And I'm like, wow, there's like so many choices. This is great. There's almost too many choices, you know? Well, it turns out that three companies control 75% of all beer sold. Um, and that's massive market concentration. They just have different names, but they're all sold, sold by the three massive conglomerates. And it turns out that that dynamic exists across many, many verticals, right? From things as, as big as, you know, airlines, Right, there's only like four big, big carriers now in the U.S. The things as niche as like coffins and PET scanners. Um, but regardless, you pick, pick a random industry. It's quite likely that three comp companies control 80% of the market. And it wasn't always like that. If you kind of go back through time, there's again, I went back to my economics roots. There's a guy at MIT, uh, I think David Ator, and his and his co-authors wrote a paper that was really good um, where they talk about the rise of the superstar firms. In other words, monopoly firms. And they analyze the NBER um, data on the economic census, and they show that industry cl cl concentration has increased across all industries or most industries um, pretty monotonically over the past 30 or 40 years. Um, 
and that's you know for the empirical finding. And you know, within the it's interesting because in, within technology, it is the case that it's not really much driven by M and A. It's mainly driven by network effects and economies of scale. But in all the other industries, so tech is the exception in this case. In all the other industries, it's primarily being driven by M and A. So I have this chart here in my paper where I show how like the there used to be dozens of defense companies that all kind of wrapped up into a few um, big players, and that's been the story. Um, in you know, like banking and cable across so many industries, and you know, M and A has just become um, this massive wave of consolidation, and it makes sense too, which is if your competitors are consolidating, you need to do the same thing, otherwise they're going to squeeze you out. Um, and you know, as an entrepreneur, the kind of sad effect is that you know, while these big firms are busy kind of gobbling up all the small firms, we're not really restocking the pond. Um, you know, entrepreneurship has been on the, the decline, despite what you hear about, you know, the glorified sexy tech entrepreneurs, um, entrepreneurship has been um, falling, you know, whether you measure it by the number of stocks in the U.S. stock market or, you know, in terms of the net firm creation, both private and public, it's just been um, on a, on a down, downward spiral. Again, I mean, this is a bit of a joke, but, you know, in 40 years from now at the current trajectory, we're going to have like five companies in the S&P. <laughs> right, like <laughs> if nothing, if nothing changes, mm. and that you know that would be kind of a scary dystopia. We have this slide we use in one of our presentations where we show concentration in the market historically, and you know what what you find historically when the market concentrates is those top firms almost inevitably do terribly going forward in the next decade. You know, there, there's been periods where the market's concentrated, and then it doesn't, and, and you know some of those top firms don't end up doing very well. I'm wondering if you think that's different this time because of things like network effects or technology. You know, do you, right now we're in another one of those periods where the market's very concentrated. And I'm wondering what you think about that. Do you think this time is going to end the way the other times ended, or do you think this time might be a little bit different with respect to that? I think it depends a lot on what you think the reasons are for the current concentration. Um, I think there's like there's like two narratives. Um, on, on one hand, you have people who are kind of more, let's say, they view it as like a monopolistic kind of robber baron mentality. Where these guys have ca have engaged in regulatory capture to like you know get you know, through lobbying and through you know the, the the creation of all this regulation made it very difficult for anyone else to compete against them and that's like this created this fortress this moat um, of regulation that will prevent them from being unseated. Um, the other kind of side of the coin might be that it's a perfectly benign explanation, which is that this is just the natural outgrowth of globalization and technology that in a globalized world. We now, we used to live in like many small ponds. Now we live in one massive pond. So if you're the most successful company, you now can eat the, eat the entire world and therefore it becomes more winner take all. And then with technology, we talked about that already. So what is your explanation? If your explanation is technology and globalization related, those things are probably here to stay. Um, well, definitely technology, maybe globalization. And um, if you're on a regulatory standpoint, it really depends. And it's so political, right? We're sitting here, it's Friday, November 6th. Um, the election, you know, is still kind of ongoing. They haven't finished counting all the ballots. Who knows when they will? Um, we don't know who's going to control the Senate. We don't even know who's going to control the presidency. Um, I think to a large extent, we have to wait until that kind of um, happens to, to know what's going to happen on the, on the antitrust side. Um, you know, you guys probably saw that on the election day when the news came out that we we're probably going to have a split um, Congress. The big tech stocks like jumped like 6%, like a lot. Um, because people were super excited about the fact that, oh, hey, Google doesn't have to worry about antitrust anymore because uh, divided Congress can't get anything done. I don't know how things are going to end up, but I think that's something to watch for sure. Um, you know, whether or not that's here to stay um, will depend a lot on politics. As a, a final question on monopolies, I want to ask you about investing in this trend. You know, we, had a, we have a research paper. We capture a lot of strategies on Validia, but one of the ones we captured was this uh, a research paper that looked at you essentially would start by finding industries that are consolidating. And then you would buy the companies that are gaining the most share within those industries. And I think you looked at a similar concept in the paper. And so can you talk a little bit about how investable this is in terms of investing in this whole idea of monopolies? Yeah, so this, the idea of this strategy actually came, you know, came uh, from, again, our old friend Warren Buffett. So you know, Buffett has also famously, in addition to technology, hated airlines. And so for a long time, he you know, used to always uh, make fun of airlines. I think in 2008, he said something along the lines of, if a far-sighted capitalist had shot down the Wright brothers at Kitty Hawk, they'd be doing everyone a favor. Um, that's how unprofitable these companies are. Well, then fast forward, you know, another eight years, 2016, Buffett buys. So after this eight-year period, all the U.S. airlines consolidate. Um, you know, many go into a few and pricing power increases. Warren Buffett says, all right, I'm going to buy them. And he doesn't just buy one, he buys all of them. He buys 
10% position in all the major airlines. Um, so he's, again, not betting on a specific company. He's betting on the industry at large. And I said, well, what if we were to replicate that systematically? What if we just said, I'm going to look for all cases where industries are consolidating um, and then buy not just one company, but buy all the companies. And it turns out that actually works pretty well. Because, you know, the first thing I tried was I said, all right, well, if this is a, if this monopoly effect is true, shouldn't it be the case that if you just buy the market leaders, you buy those three companies that control 80% of the market, that then you're, you're just going to dominate. Well, the market's pretty smart. The market knows that these companies have monopoly power and knows they have higher margins and hence they have higher P ratios and price to book ratios. And so that kind of cancels out the benefit you get from the higher profitability. So that strategy didn't work, but what did work was looking at changes. So it turns out that the market is a little bit slow, apparently, to recognize that consolidation will lead to increased pricing power moving forward, or at least has been. Um, this is a back test. And oh, by the way, that links back to our value discussion. So we already said, look, value investors are short disruption. Value investors are short technology, they're short FANG. Value investors are short intangible rich companies. They're short companies that most of their value is in their brand or is in their IP. Well, look, value investors are also short monopolies because they're sitting there saying, well, look, look at the price to book of these, you know, superstar firms so high. Why would I buy them? I should, you know, buy their competitors and short them. But look, they're missing the fact that these are monopolists. Like, are you really, do you really think that they're going to be unseated, at least in the near term? Unlikely. And so, you know, you have all these headwinds now that have, you know, that together explain a lot of why value hasn't worked. Um, just to wrap up, I, I want to ask you sort of this final question. And it's something that as I've been listening to you talk and, and I knew this was going to be a really good podcast because these are really solid research pieces and you've articulated these trends, these narratives, you know, it's backed up by data and research that you've been able to do. And I think just this, like I said at the beginning, this arc of what is changing in the market has very important implications. But what do you think for an individual investor? A lot of the people that listen to our podcast, they are individual investors. That's most of the people that sort of use Validia. And we sort of run these standard, fundamentally based investment strategies. So we're not doing any machine learning or anything like that. And obviously, I'd say 99% of individual investors also aren't doing like machine learning and AI techniques. So do you think this... Um, sort of these arguments that you're presenting makes the case stronger for passive investing for most individual investors um, because they're not going to be able to assess companies intangibles or find companies maybe that might be, I mean, you might be able to get a sense, you might feel that, but in terms of actually implementing that, so do you think this actually makes a stronger argument for most investors just going into a passive index not trying to worry about this or do you sort of think that you know no i think you know most investors should be thinking about these things and trying to adjust their investment strategies based on things that we've talked about i mean that's a tough question um i think you know you guys asked me about um you know brooke levin the accounting um disclosures and you know what that and what we should do on that side. I think the problem with passive investing is that they are just going to take things at face value. And I guess kind of the thing I'm trying to push in, in especially in the intangibles paper, is that you can't just do that. We, we need to start incorporating this additional information into financial markets. Like the idea of like patents not being fully used, the idea of brand value not being fully incorporated, right? Whether it's a traditional first of book model or just a standard, you know, cap weighted ETF. You know, you're, this information is like, is critical and until it's, you know, fully incorporated in the market, there is a opportunity for investors who want to create alpha, but, you know, also on the flip side, you know, those who are just purely passive are just going to be taking it. Great. Well, we've talked about a lot here, so this is a great, uh, great discussion. I think you'll be hopefully coming on our podcast again, but hopefully you'll be coming on other podcasts and sort of sharing your, 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 your knowledge and, and what you're researching here. If people want to sort of learn more about you and Sparkline and, and the topics that you're investigating and more about your firm, where can they go? Uh, just go to my website, uh, sparklinecapital.com. Great. Thank you, Kai. Thanks a lot for Thank having me. Thank you very on. much. This is great. Thank you.
Take care. Hi guys, this is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Excess Returns. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at @practicalquant and follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carboneau. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube or leave a review or a comment. We appreciate it.